Hi, I'm Eric Rosenberg from Personal Profitability, and when I'm not busy hustling my tuchus off, I am stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today is a very special day for me because on this date in history, my favorite actor of all time, the amazing Marky Mark Wahlberg, was born. I mean, we have so much in common, but I'll share more later with you. We all know that Marky Mark is well known for making some extreme pivots in his career. So today we'll ask the question, how can we pivot more quickly toward better money decisions? To help us tackle this topic, let's welcome from the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, a guy who's made major pivots to get where he is today, Scott Trench. And from the desert of Las Vegas, from Afford Anything, it's Paula Pant. And from this here podcast, it's Ted the Bear. Now, I wish though, that bear is so hilarious. It's just OG. Also, hey, how's your eating been? Around here, we've all gained the COVID-19, if you know what I mean. So just in time, let's say hello to our resident health and wellness expert, Angelo Poli from MetPro. Of course, we'll also magnify a lucky listener's money, and it would be a crime if I didn't share some Mark Wahlberg-related trivia. And now a guy who would kill to have a bod like me and a friend like Marky, it's Joe Salciha. Of course I would, Doug. Body like that. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Friday here on the Stacky Benjamin Show. I am Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across the card table from me to usher in the weekend, it's our good friend, OG. How are you, man? Great, actually. Um, I'm glad that Doug finally realized that uh, there is somebody in the basement that does look a little bit like uh, Marky Mark. Oh, and, uh, are you saying that he's looking at the wrong side of the table? That's what you're he saying. Is, uh, he is, uh, yes. Yes, I can do at least three pull-ups, and I think that's a really big thing to be able to do pull-ups when you're working out. So usually they're a little bit assisted. Like I can do the assisted ones where you just kind of stand on the ground and then pull yourself up. You jump. I, Basically, it's jumping. I can it, jump. I was going to say, I'm fine as long as there's a chair under me and I'm fairly close to that bar. Exactly. So it's it's ah. fantastic. And somebody who sets the bar high with her podcast, how about that transition? It's Paula Pant. Oh, man, I was actually about to crack a joke about how I'm always lowering the bar. <laughs> bar so low, it's a limbo. It's just a limbo uh, bar now. <laughs> but I got there first. How are you? Big? Are you a big Mark Wahlberg fan? Uh, no. She has no idea who Mark Wahlberg is. Do you know who Mark Wahlberg is? He's a, a white guy. Oh, boy. Yes, <laughs> he is. That's correct. No, I, I, I can picture him. Like brown hair, right? <laughs> brown hair. <laughs> Nice shot in the dark. Yeah, and I think he's medium height. <laughs> <laughs> and he has two eyes. Right. <laughs> yes. Oh, I can't wait for the trivia for you, Paula. It's going to be painful. <laughs> and a guy who's wondering what the heck he's doing here, probably because if any of us look like Marky Mark, it's probably him. Mr. Scott Trench joins us. Oh, how's it going, everybody? And I don't know about that uh, that compliment with looking like Mark Wahlberg. All I know about him is his a very intense schedule that he's got, apparently, where he wakes up super early, works out five times, all that kind of stuff. So thank you for the compliment. But you guys have that in common, right? Don't you work out five times, get up really early? You know, I kind of woke up a couple weeks ago and realized that I'm gaining a little bit of weight here. <laughs> so I've actually been committing to a new diet, doing a state of slim, do, trying to do some pull-ups. I've gone from being able to do three, uh, like OG, and now, now I can do uh, about 10. So making some progress over the last little bit of coronavirus lockdown here. You know what the best thing to do is when you wake up early in the morning, Scott? What's that? You read the stacker. That's our Stacky Benjamins newsletter that you can get by going to stackybenjamins.com forward slash stacker. It's fantastic. You'll start your day with a good cry. Uh, you'll find out everything that's going on in the basement. You can find out all the money lessons from uh, the times that Joe was horrible with money back in the day. It is uh, absolutely fantastic, Scott. You'd love it. Man, this is not your first time doing this, huh, Joe? <laughs> it's just all these cool transitions. <laughs> well, we're so happy. We got Scott Trench here, half of the Bigger Pockets Money Duo. We got Paula here. We got OG here. So let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. 
Today's piece uh, that we're going to talk about comes to us from the Wise Bread blog, and it's written by my friend and uh, actually co-author on a book we're writing together, Emily Guy Birkin. It's called How to Use Financial Anchors to Make Better Money Decisions. And who better to read this than Emily Guy Birkin herself? Emily? Cognitive bias known as anchoring gets a bad rap. This universal mental accounting quirk causes us to rely on the first piece of information we hear to make decisions. For instance, let's say you're thinking about saving up for a down payment on a house when you learn that a coworker just bought a house for $375,000. Suddenly, that number becomes your anchor point, and you compare all other home prices to this number. This becomes a serious problem if the average home price in your area is wildly different from what your coworker paid. If most first-time buyers spend something closer to $200,000, you're likely to overspend because your view of normal is skewed too high. However, financial anchors can do more than just warp your sense of an appropriate amount to pay. Intentionally adopting anchors can also help you to make better money decisions. Here's how. Monthly payment decisions. There are basic rules of thumb for what percentage of your income you should spend on housing, car payments, and the like. For instance, you'll often see the claim that you should not spend more than 30% of your monthly income on your rent or mortgage. To make this an anchor point that can actually help you make better financial decisions, take the time to do the math and use your anchor point as a hard stop for what you are willing to spend. If you net $3,500 per month income, you could plan to spend no more than about $1,000 per month on rent, because $3,500 times 0.3 equals $1,050. If you decide ahead of time that your anchor point is the absolute maximum you are willing to spend, then it's easier to say no to the options that may seem like they're only a little bit outside of your price range. After all, an apartment that rents for $1,200 per month may not seem like a big stretch above your 30% rule, but it adds up to an additional $2,400 per year. With an unyielding dollar amount already chosen before you begin looking at apartments, cars, or other big ticket items you plan to pay for monthly, you can help prevent temptation from encouraging you to outspend your budget. Even if the 30% rule is unreasonable for the area where you live, you can still use the process of creating an anchor point to help you stay within the budget that makes sense for your area. Fun Purchases I'm an avid audiobook listener, and I've been an Audible subscriber for several years. Despite being a financial expert, I regularly cannot figure out if it makes financial sense for me to purchase an audiobook outright or use one of my credits for the purchase. That's because I pay nearly $16 per month to subscribe to this service. Each month, I receive a free credit, which means I'm paying $16 for each monthly credit. So it feels like I'm wasting money if I use a credit on an audiobook that costs anything less than $16. But if I buy the inexpensive audiobook outright, then I've spent my monthly $16 fee plus the cost of the audiobook. Anchoring could help me make these decisions less onerous. If I set an anchor point of $10 as the maximum amount I'm willing to spend in money rather than credits on an audiobook, it'll give me a mental shortcut to help me make quicker and more economical decisions. Any fun items you like to purchase can benefit from a similar hard anchor point. If you love buying notebooks, shoes, music downloads, or the like, setting a hard limit on the maximum amount of money you can spend on any one purchase will make it easier to leave the tempting but expensive items on the shelf. Of course, even with such an anchor, you still need to make sure you know how much you're spending overall. Each purchase below your anchor can still add up to quite a large amount if you're not paying attention. Your time. If you're time-strapped, hiring someone to help you with necessary but unpleasant tasks can be a huge lifesaver. However, for a lot of people, the costs of a house cleaner, dog walker, or personal assistant can feel far too high. Many will decide that they'll just do the mopping or other tasks themselves. The problem with this plan is that it still keeps you time-strapped, and it's likely the tasks will go undone or poorly done. Anchoring can help you make the decision about whether it's worthwhile for you to hire help. Calculating how much your time is worth will give you a baseline that will help you determine what you can afford from service providers. To figure out your hourly net worth, divide your annual income by $2,000. The average American works about 2,000 hours per year. That means if you earn $60,000 per year, your hourly income is $30. If the house cleaner you're interested in charges $115 per month for bi-weekly cleaning, you'd have to decide if their two visits to clean your home from top to bottom will save you more than 3.8 hours each month that you would otherwise spend cleaning or annoyed at the messy state of your home. The anchor point of your hourly net worth can put the cost of a service in perspective since it gives you a concrete amount to compare. Update your anchors regularly. 
Creating personal anchors to help you make better financial decisions can give you a great mental shortcut, but it's important to update your anchors every so often, about once a year, to make sure you're not making important new decisions with outdated anchors. Your money choice shortcuts are only as good as the anchors you're using, and if you're making decisions based on your income from a more lucrative job, the prices in a lower cost of living area, or old prices that have risen because of inflation, then you're likely to overspend, frustrate yourself, or even get embarrassed when you use an outdated anchor. Imagine my embarrassment when I realized I'd been using the anchor of tip delivery drivers $1 for many years after my parents taught it to me in the early 90s. Use your anchors wisely. Knowing the maximum that you're willing to spend on something gives you a great way to know when to say no. Having such a hard and fast rule allows you to make smarter decisions more quickly and with less temptation. Thanks, Emily. You know, it's interesting. I'm going to start off here, Scott, with you, because when it comes to, to financial anchors, one of the first things I thought about, of course, you can't think of where you live, bigger pockets, right? And not think about financial anchors because people get these numbers in their head around how much house they can afford. And when I think about anchors that probably could be bad, I think that might be one. Yeah. I mean, when you think about coming up with these anchors in the first place, it's very dangerous because if you come at it from a lack of a, lacking a framework for thinking about this or lacking being well read, your framework's going to be whatever your best friend, your mother, your cousin, whatever they're buying or whatever they're doing, that becomes your anchor or, your, or how you're approaching the problem. But if you've read a lot on the subject or listened to a lot of podcasts like these, you're going to be able to develop, you're going to get exposure to a lot more anchors and settle on one that's more appropriate for your position. You agree with that, OG, that it really is who you surround yourself by? Well, when it comes to spending money, you've got to be really careful about who you surround yourself by because there's that really real, like keeping up with the Joneses type stuff. And it can be really tough to Paul, back away from that if you have to. Yeah. Paula, when it comes to anchors that you see that are big mistakes, right? People have mm -hmm. these inadvertent anchors. What do you think? What do you think of initially that might be a big bad one? Well, housing, as you talked about, cars are a big one. Clothing can be a big one. Um Daily money, I don't I don't know if this would totally, totally qualify, but unintentional spending, you know, those when you go out with your friends and it becomes super normalized to just grab some stuff at the coffee shop or, you know, you know what I mean? Like that, that kind of carelessness in terms of spending, when that becomes normalized, when you think that that is just how people interact with their money. I think that that, I guess, relationship with money is another anchor. I, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So just because I did it yesterday means it's okay to do it today. That type of anchoring. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you, you observe the way that other people have a relationship with money, the way that they interact with money. And that becomes the anchor in terms of this is sort of the normal way to do it or this is the way that uh, this is the appropriate way to do it. One of the reasons I want to have you on with this particular topic, Scott, was because of the fact that in your fantastic book, Set for Life, I felt like it's in three parts, right? Which are these real anchors that you're setting out for people. Is that what you intended to do was say, here's the pathway and and you want to get there by X time, X date? Or uh, tell me about that. Yeah, absolutely. So when I when I started my financial journey, most people don't really have an anchor with money in general as a, as a framework. Like, hey, wh what am I earning and spending this money for? It's it's how do I get the best possible job and then spend around that for my lifestyle, put away 5%, 10% for retirement? Well, very quickly, I discovered Mr. Money Mustache and this whole financial independence movement. And that became my new anchor. And so everything I was listening to, all the, all the content I was surrounding myself with, all the blogs I was reading, podcasts, all that kind of stuff was around that concept. So that became my normal. And for housing in particular, that was a really big problem because if you look around online, you'll see, hey, you should spend no more than 30% of your monthly income on your rent or mortgage, whatever that is. But if you're in a hundred grand, why should you spend 30 on housing if you can get away with spending half of that, the same rate that a person earning 50 grand does, why can't you begin to live for free? And so as soon as my anchor became financial freedom, the spiritual or framework anchor for my overall approach to money, everything began to kind of come together in the context of that. And it was around, hey, my anchor for housing became, how do I live for free? How do I have my mortgage completely covered by tenants and that source of income so that I can completely wipe out this cost of housing and thus accelerate my, my journey towards wealth creation as much as possible. That's obviously particularly appealing to the 23-year-old or 24-year-old I was when I first started house hacking, and I'm starting to realize why that may not be applicable to families or, or less appealing in some 
some ways to families down the line. But when I think about anchors in terms of housing decisions, that was my anchor. My, my next anchor is probably going to be, what is the lifestyle that I want now that I've achieved financial freedom, but that is paid for from my other assets and passive income around that housing? So whenever I do buy that forever home, I'll be able to do so from that context. Gotcha. So starting off with, I want this thing, but then second, how can I afford it without the big payment plan that everybody lives their life according to? Yes. And I realize that's a very extreme anchor, right? Most people aren't, aren't going to have that kind of extreme anchor. But what is a reasonable housing anchor, I guess, you know, is another way to frame the question that we get there. And, you know, I'm interested to hear other people's perspectives on that. But, you know, for me, it would be, what does a median income earner in your area live for? And then can you live slightly below that regardless of your income? That's how you can build wealth as you continue to increase or expand your income. Maybe that's a good starting point for the discussion, at least. Yeah, and I thought that was interesting. I also thought when you set off on your own journey and, you know, Paula was mentioning you know, going out for coffees with friends or going out for beers with friends or just going out to dinner, whatever that is. I'm imagining that some of that had to go by the wayside. How painful was that sacrifice when you decided you were clearing the deck for financial freedom at an early age? All right. So here's, so I have a, I think an interesting answer to that. When you look at the pie chart of American household spending, two thirds of that, two thirds of the average American household spending go into transportation, housing, and food. And so my solution was, I did not want to cut back on my beer and partying budget when I was 23, 24 <laughs> after graduating college. You're I was focused. not going to do that. You're focused. That was, that was, yeah, that piece of the pie was as big or bigger than everybody else's at that point in my life. I was going to say, how do I live for free? How do I get around for free? And then how do I keep my food budget under great control. And so within a year of graduating college, I was creating that situation where I was biking to work almost every day, where I lived in a house hack where my tenants were paying for my mortgage. And then I was eating reasonable food that I self-prepared from grocery stores for almost all of my meals. And then I probably drank like a fish with my buddies <laughs> on the weekends. <laughs> oh, gee, it sounds like Scott had his priorities in order. <laughs> Yeah, he did. The thing that uh, that I was thinking about while Scott and Paul were talking about this was a phrase that I've come to learn and appreciate recently called the normalization of deviation. And in the context of money and spending in particular, which is where I think it gets slippery, it's always great to have good anchors for saving and investing and all that sort of stuff. But if you're going to get in trouble, you're going to get in trouble in spending. And we were talking about you know, eating out or going out to dinner. And I, I was thinking specifically of a time where I went to dinner uh, with my wife. I think we were married at the time. The all-in Valentine's Day meal was 200 bucks, And I almost choked when the guy brought the, you know, when he brought the, the tab. I'm thinking, oh, my. And when you're around other people, if you don't pay attention to it, it can get out of hand in a hurry. And you just go, oh, well, it's only 100 bucks. There's only 200 bucks. But what you're doing at that point in time is you're normalizing that behavior. Not that it's not good or bad. It's just you're saying, well, that's that's my new barometer for spending. And that can be really dangerous. That alone, I think, OG, is a reason to track your spending right there. Yeah, not only your spending, but I think having an idea on a day-to-day -day basis or at least a week-to-week -week basis where you're at relative to where everything is in your life. If you look at how successful people handle money, they all do it different ways. Some people are very specific about, you know, every dollar and cent I keep track of in a journal or a budget calculator or a tool. Some people just say, I've got a broad-based approach to it, but all of them know what the number is. They say, okay, my spending is going to be $4,000 a month, which means it's 1000 every Friday, you know? And if you get a little bit ahead of that, you've got to have the discipline to be able to pull the reins in a little bit for whatever reason. But you're right. You, de you absolutely positively have to have at least some semblance of what that number should look like on a monthly basis. Paula, with what OG's talking about, it seems like your budget is much more like Scott's. It kind of everything falls around. You're going to clearly do your drinking on the weekend <laughs> and everything falls around that. And I'm certainly not going to do my drinking on the Stacking Benjamins roundtable. <laughs> <laughs> You're usually the only person who isn't. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm still, even to this day, I'm drinking a water with apple cider vinegar. I have to say, I am not drinking today, which is weird for this particular recording. We, we, <laughs> and just for people, for people listening, Monday, Wednesday shows, no drinking. Friday roundtable, okay. game on. 
just to throw this up there, this is like the year after I graduated college. You know, I, I've definitely <laughs> turned back a little bit, except for at conferences now. Scott, <laughs> Scott's trying to defend his honor now. I can hear it in his voice. Like, whoa, whoa, I don't want that reputation. But, no, but, I, but I, I really liked, I mean, I, I liked both of those comments. The normalization of deviation is such a good phrase. Yeah. I'm going to remember that. But, you know, but I agree. I, I Scott, I had the same approach to housing that you did in that I saw people, you know, that the anchor of spend 30% of your income on housing, that didn't make any sense to me. Like for me, I, I wanted that housing bill to be zero. Um, and so I, I took that same approach. How do I get this to zero? But the other thing that I was thinking about as I was listening to both of you is the anchor that is often not discussed is how much people are saving for retirement or how much people are saving in general. Like because that's invisible, because that happens through bank account transfers on your laptop or through your phone and it's not visible, it's not tangible, like there's there's no way to see with any degree of accuracy, what your friends and neighbors are actually doing, how much they're saving, how much they're contributing for retirement. And so oftentimes, if you hear some offhand comment, it's possible for that to stick in your mind as the anchor. Like, essentially, mm. there's so little data that the limited number or two that you might hear may receive disproportionate value in your mind. Well, and, we um, also we yeah. also start, Paula, to only see the visible stuff as a sign of wealth, right? Like the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's really what the millionaire next door talks about. Without any data to know what's in somebody's bank account, you look at the car they drive, the house they live in, and you make a, a judgment call on whether they're wealthy or not. And as you know, we've all read in that book, it, it often is very misleading. Right, Exactly. Exactly. Because there's conspicuous consumption, but there's no conspicuous retirement savings. I think that that often leads people to assume, hopefully, like there are some people who assume that others aren't saving as much as those others actually are. I say hopefully because that would indicate, you know, that implies a society in which most people are saving a good amount. But, you know, to the person who assumes that their neighbors have a lower savings rate than the neighbors actually do, like that person could end up being very behind all because of an erroneous assumption. Do you guys think that we as podcasters and, and, and folks who talk about this stuff at length, like we're talking about money all day long and this is what we do for a living, a lot of us, you know, do you feel like that work and the growth of the financial independence movement and all the, the tangential things from that are helping people set better anchors on average than maybe was previous? Do you think, I don't know. I, I, I felt I experienced that as a listener years ago, prior to, to ever doing a podcast or anything like that, by listening and hearing that. That helped me frame those anchors in a way that I couldn't get from friends, family, or, or other folks where it's just not talked about. Yeah. yeah. I think it's helped a lot. Certainly, it's through the FIRE community that my new anchor that's in my head is a 50% savings rate. And and I like the how clean it is to just think, all right, I get to spend half and I get to save half. And in the spend category, I don't have to worry about anything. Like if I want to spend on ridiculous, stupid stuff, I can as long as it's limited to 50%. In comparison to mainstream society, that's a fairly extreme anchor. So it's it's a nice new one to have. Yeah, I love that. I wish I'd thought of that. When I was thinking about some of the big anchors here, that is a key anchor that I think is so healthy for the financial independence movement in general and, and just people. Like if you get a 50% savings rate, you're going to be pretty good no matter what other actions you're really taking we have, as long as you play, apply the basic fundamentals there. Which is crazy fantastic because I feel like when that number was first thrown out there, like it was more of a dare, like a dare you to get to 50. And then it became this cool thing, right? See if I can get to 50 because – and talk about great anchors, yeah, exactly. And and it's so liberating. Like there's no beating yourself up for spending too much money on whatever, on on beer, because at the end of the day, you've set your limit and you know that that limit is super um, great. Like, you yeah, know. yeah. So but I just need to make twice as much money, basically. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Because <laughs> I like my spending right where it is. That's that's the one thing that I've got. I've got nailed. I've got spending nailed. But do you think that the podcast, uh, well, what do you think about Scott's question, OG? No, I, no, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, is that it's still woefully underrepresented in the entire universe of stuff, right? I mean, yeah, the whole idea of 
financial literacy, which is um, very inadequate for most people across the globe. Yeah, we've got our little our little group of people that listen to our show, and Scott's got his, and it's ten times bigger than ours. But you know, nevertheless, it's still you know it's still you know, know it's about still that. a small small deal, right? I mean, the grand scheme of things, we're mentioning this uh, some time ago, Joe. You and I were talking about how. Dave Ramsey's got 10 million people that listen to his show. It's like, but there's 300 million Americans. He's he's even like a small a nobody. Yeah. drop in the bucket. So yeah, I've, I think it helps. I hope it helps. Uh, otherwise, what the hell are we doing all this for, frankly? But um, some of it's good. Some of it's not good. But I think everybody's got the best intentions. So if you like getting yelled at to pay off your debt, you know where to turn, you know? And <laughs> and that's stupid. Well, that, if, it, it, if you know who that guy is, it, it, who who would that be? But it could be a woman who does that too. I mean, the other very you need popular five person. Five million dollars and don't day trade. But yeah. let me show you how I day. How traded. I day traded. Amazing. Right. Amazing. I, I think these anchors, when you hear somebody that you can relate to, or meet somebody that you can relate to, and see them doing something that re- results in an outcome that you think is repeatable. Like, I think that's the key to all of this, right? Is, is what are people doing out there that are in similar situations to you that's working? Ordinary guy does follows repeatable plan to achieve extraordinary result. Like that is what it's all about when you're, when you're setting your anchors. Otherwise it's going to be really difficult, right? It's not, it's going to be very hard, for example, to repeat a path to starting a highly successful business from scratch for most people. But for most people who earn fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year, spending 35000 and getting to a 30, 35% savings rate is probably a relatable anchor that they can, they can latch on to. And I think that's the key is just have absorb as many of these perspectives as you possibly can and come up with a responsible anchor that's realistic and attainable for you. Well, and Paula, that's why I love what Scott's saying. And I love what OG said. I don't love what OG said, but, <laughs> but I get what OG said. And I totally agree with it, that there, there is nobody listening. And I kind of feel like this whole discussion, Paula, just revolves around getting people in the room. It, it, it's almost like, you know, if financial independence was a sales pitch, like multi-level marketing, <laughs> this, this crap sells itself, right? <laughs> all you got to do is get people in the room. And if you're relatable at all, people are going to buy it, which, which makes it doubly frustrating. <laughs> well, I think that people, not all people, but many people will find it when they're ready because, you know, over the lifespan of any given individual, there are going to be points in time when they're just not receptive to a message and uh, different points in time in which they are. And so with financial independence, oftentimes it's when people are frustrated by work, they've, they've had a hard day at work, they hate their boss, um, something is going wrong, That's that becomes that triggering event that leads them to Google, like, how do I, how do I quit my job when I'm 35? And then they just stumble upon this. So, you know, if you take like a, a super optimistic 21-year-old who's just about to graduate from college and thinks that like their career is going to be great, the notion of fire might not make sense to, to that person at that time. Do most college kids think that? I was terrified of the real world. I was terrified by the two weeks of vacation that I kept hearing about. That sounded yeah. like a prison sentence. The first paycheck was cool, but the the <laughs> the vacation time was not. Yeah, that was yeah. terrifying. I just remember thinking that getting a check with a comma in it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember my favorite part was the fact that all of the work that I did was paid work. As opposed to when you're in college and you do all this unpaid work of going to class, doing your homework, like you have all of that unpaid academic work. And then, if you know, 20 hours a week of paid work, but you're working 60 hours a week in total. Yeah, it was amazing to graduate. And then all of a sudden, every hour that you put in, you're getting paid for. I'm going to link to this uh, piece on our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com because there's so much more we could talk about here. We could we could dig into the idea of these rules of thumb. Like when is it a rule of thumb? When is it an anchor? Uh, there's an interesting thing there. I also think, and Paula, you've talked about this a lot in the past, your time, right? Setting new anchors for your time and what's your time worth. Mm-hmm. There's still a lot here. But from the stuff that we covered, uh, we'll give our guest of honor the the last word. Paula, what's our takeaway? Question your assumptions about what quote unquote normal is in every aspect of your financial life. So question your assumptions about a normal savings rate, a normal retirement contribution rate, the normal amount of money that 
that is normal to spend on housing or transportation or food. Like question all of those assumptions and ask yourself where they came from. OG? I just think you got to be careful if you start letting little things slide in terms of spending, especially if you're thinking about this from the anchoring perspective. If you start letting little things slide, all of a sudden that becomes kind of normalized and now you start letting bigger things slide. So be careful. And Scott, you got the last word, my friend. All right. I'll I'll support both of those and say, go seek out what other people who are in similar situations to where you are currently, what they've done to be successful or what they're doing to be successful. And ask yourself, which of those folks has a reasonable, repeatable approach for you that's a healthy anchor? So uh, who here hasn't put on the COVID-19 yet? Let's be real. Scott, you putting on your COVID-19? I definitely put on a COVID-12, maybe we'll call it. And then, uh, like I said, mentioned earlier, I started a new (laughs) diet, no booze, working out, P90X. Man, the P90X, that is some hardcore stuff. The retro, I I built up a whole garage dream, which I love and hate right now. Yeah. Now, do you have that on uh, VHS tape, the P90X? <laughs> no, I've got it online on the uh, Beachbody subscription, but I should Perfect. get it. They, they actually cite the discs the whole time. <laughs> the discs. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's okay because um, uh, OG's doing the Cindy Crawford workout. Isn't that right? Richard Simmons. Get it correct. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> nice. Jazzercise, dude. <laughs> and I do have the uh, P90X discs also. Yes. And Paula bucking the trend. Paula is on a weight loss plan, but <laughs> I've lost like three pounds. Yes. So yeah. yeah. But I will say when you're five foot one, your your numbers in either direction are a lot smaller. Like for someone who's five one to put on nineteen pounds is Might be a you, lot. You might you know? see a little change there. Yeah. Slight yeah. change. Well, uh, this gentleman has been on the show several times answering your questions. We went to our Facebook group and asked them for a bunch of your health questions and health so tied into money. How can you make money? How can you do your job if you're not feeling healthy? And Angelo Poli is certainly a guy who's worked with a lot of healthy people. So we threw a bunch of questions his way. Let's say hi to Angelo Poli from MetPro. It is amazing how this change in lifestyle over to everything is at home. We're at home. We, we have to figure out a way to get out of the house sometimes. We have to figure out how our exercise routine is. We're now cooking at home. All that has changed everything. And of course, that means we definitely need to think about our diet. We also need to think about our exercise. And there's one man I love talking to about all that stuff more than anybody else. My friend Angelo Poli from MetPro joins us on Dead Shortwave. How are you holding up, man? I am great. Uh, surprisingly, I am holding up. I have nothing to complain about these days. I'm, I'm sure everyone could think of a few things, but I always try and make the best of whatever's thrown thrown my way, even if it isn't great stuff thrown my way. Right, Joe? <laughs> right. Yes. Absolutely. Well, the good news is I've only got great stuff for you today, my friend, because we asked our friends in the basement. We asked them, uh, which is our Facebook group. If you're not there, it's uh, stackybedjamins.com forward slash basement. Everybody gets you there if you want to uh, help us make some of these shows. But we asked our friends there to just fire questions at you. So my goal today, Angelo, is to make you sweat is to stump me, right? It is. Yeah. It is. <laughs> well, ask my wife. She'll attest it's not hard. I can be stumped. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I Fire have away. I have a feeling that you're going to knock these out of the park. But, you know, here's the first thing, Angelo, as you know, we're all at home. I have to remind myself to get up a few times a day. I'm sure you have to remind yourself to stay active. Sariti, our friend Sariti asks, how do you increase your activity inside the home consistently, especially when you used to go to the office via public transportation or you bike there? So Sariti very naturally has kind of this higher amount of exercise she's doing and all of a sudden she's not getting it anymore. How do you begin planning that out, Angelo? This is a question that I have been asked for the last two decades, not just recently. It's just now it's super pertinent. I am a huge fan 
of micro workouts. I kind of made up that name micro workouts to really emphasize short, brisk, opportunistic activity. So in our day to day lives, typically, we're so busy that catch, you know, getting dressed, driving to the gym, the hour it takes out of your day, then cleaning up after ends up being a roadblock. So for a lot of my executives, and for a lot of people who are really pressed for time and busy with meetings and errands, let's fit in a five to eight minute activity sprint that we can do with just body weight, simple movements. You don't have to come up with anything elaborate. You need a little bit of floor space. It could be as simple as doing a few crunches, a few push-ups, a few body weight squats. What happens is, you know, you're unlikely to transform your physique in five minutes a day. But what it's doing is it's giving you a metabolic spike. And that's what my clients really are looking for is, hey, Angela, what are your top 10 ways to speed your metabolism? For a long time, there's been the trick that physique trainers will use with some of their competitors to have their competitors exercise more frequently and do shorter bursts. Well, we can utilize a little bit of that in this case. Grab five, 10 minutes here, set an alarm clock. It could be two times a day. It could be three times a day and make it a game. I can do so many body weight squats. I can do so many push-ups in a minute. I can do so many crunches in a minute. Do that a few times throughout the day, and you'll be surprised at how you can still get a spike in your metabolism, and you can burn off some extra calories. Which is interesting because Rick has a question that's very similar, and he asked, one-hour workout with minimal breaks during the workout. So work out hard, right? Or three 20-minute workouts spread over the day with minimal to no breaks. It sounds like you're advocating the latter. Three 20-minute breaks beats one one-hour workout? That's a good question. So the answer is I am, I'm always a practical. I'm a practical coach, so I'm always looking for whatever's going to big picture get the greatest result. And that means whatever you can be consistent with. So a few things you have to think about. Now, if you're talking about an elite-level athlete, then <clears throat> to train yourself in the – anaerobic pathways, endurance, to basically become better at endurance sports, there is no substitution for raw time. You can't do it in 20 minutes. You have to tax your body for longer consecutive minutes. If your goal is simply health and fitness, then there is an argument for three separate spikes if you have the circumstance. Now, if you're talking 20 minutes three times a day, the average person will say that's more intrusive. If you have the circumstance to do it, by all means, go for it. But that's three times you're going to warm up, you're going to cool down in 20 minutes. That's a real workout. That's no longer a micro workout or grabbing a few crunches in between. That's a full-on workout. And then there's your nervous system. How much can you recover from? So if that workout, if that, that exercise is moderate, then spreading it out through the day is probably doable. But if it's super high intensity, if you're an elite athlete or even a garage warrior, you know, on the weekends, then you have to think about giving your body some recovery. So it's really different based on your circumstance. Go with whatever you can be the most consistent with. He does ask a few pointed questions there, though, Angelo. Is one of them better for weight loss? Is either of those better for muscle gain? Like in those particular areas, does one beat the other? So I do a lot of works with algorithms. In fact, recently, it's one of the things I'm working on, basically calculating how your body is going to respond and giving a value. Of course, it's subjective, but subjective based off of two decades and you know thousands and thousands of people doing this. What is the value of exercise? So here's the answer. I've actually recently worked on the difference between something that we call HIIT training, high-intensity interval yeah, training, yeah. versus endurance training. And I actually just recently got asked this question, what is the better modality from a uh, weight loss or metabolism perspective? And the answer is minute for minute, there's a higher value given to the high intensity. However, I allow somebody to calculate more minutes if they are doing endurance training. And here's what that means. If somebody says, I did 20 minutes of endurance training versus 20 minutes of HIIT training, hands down, the high intensity is going to be the bigger value. 
if somebody comes back to me and says, I did three hours of HIIT training, hands down, they're lying through their teeth. <laughs> right. I was going to say, because you can't sustain it. <laughs> I've, done, I've done the one hour HIIT training workouts at right. my gym before. And, and if you're telling me an hour and 10 minutes, I know you're lying. Correct. That you're, well, you're not really doing HIIT training at that point. So I will let somebody record three hours of biking or a half marathon or something that could be a long endurance activity. That's realistic. But somebody to do interval training for that, I mean, that people can't sustain that. So that's where, of course, the practical nature comes in. So in short bursts, minute for minute, the high intensity activity is going to have the most caloric expenditure. However, it's going to place the most demand on your body for recovery. And you probably can't sustain a lot of that. That's why when people ask what's better, the answer is do both. Yeah. If you want to optimize, do both. All your elite endurance and uh, athletic coaches are going to have speed days and stamina days, and they're going to split them up. And it's because of that recovery element. I love that. It's also interesting to me as, as you're talking and I'm asking these questions. When we had you on at the beginning of the year and also around the new year and also uh, at the beginning of December, those questions were all about food. This is the same group of people. Now they're all about exercise. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's great. I love it. <laughs> uh, uh, Jessica wonders, by the way, is there any difference if you're going for weight loss, whether it's AM or PM? Is there a difference in your metabolism? So under certain circumstances, there can be. The very resounding answer to that, Jessica, is do it whenever you're going to be the most consistent. That by far is going to give you the greatest benefit. So if you are most consistent in the AM, do it in the AM, PM, do it in the PM. That said, here's the practical things to look at. Every hour beyond waking up that you go before exercising, statistically, you are less likely to exercise. That's not a desire thing. It's not a willpower thing. It's just a practical hours in the day. There is more opportunity for stuff to come up. That's why a lot of people are more successful exercising either first thing in the morning or at least the first half of the day. Less things can come up. If you want to do what's called fasting state cardio, Sometimes that refers to, uh, it's a reference to not having nothing in your system when you're doing exercise or not having had carbohydrates for about 8 to 12 hours, which is like a mild form of glycogen depletion. Then there is some mild benefit to doing it first thing in the morning. Sometimes that gets blown out of proportion. I would much rather a more consistent workout schedule than a couple days a week have a fasting state cardio. But if you're wanting the real nerdy, geeky, biological nuance of it, then yes, if your last meal is a 7.30 the night before and you haven't had any carbs and you wake up and you exercise at 7.30 a.m., you're going to get a slight emphasis. You're going to be in that lipolytic pathway, fat burning zone slightly earlier in that workout than you may have otherwise been. You also may have a little less energy for muscle building. So it's a trade-off. I remember a coach of mine telling me one time, Angelo, that the best time is first thing in the morning to run because you want to get out there before your brain knows what the hell you're up to. <laughs> I think I'd like that. Coach. <laughs> I yep, do. That's it. I do want to ask one uh, food related question before we say goodbye, which comes from Gina. And a lot of people actually, there were a few people that asked this question, Angela, which is how do you break a sugar addiction in quarantine? As you know, a lot of people are anxious. They're stressed. And uh, Gina says she feels like your options are limited reaching for sugar carbs and it feels like the best way to mollify yourself. It, it's this it's this way to make you feel a little more comfort. You know, how do you break the sugar habit? Gina, you, you are right and you are not alone. Um, lots of people feel that way, self-included. So with that said, human psychology around sugar and, and even just any sort of food behavior is an interesting thing. Nobody, nobody on this planet knows better than what Oreo cookies are going to do to your waistline, your metabolism, and your body better than me. If they are in my house, I will eat them. 
So my strategy, Joe, is I don't bring them in the house because if they're in the house, I eat them. Yet, very rarely, I would be lying if I said never, but very rarely will I 9.30 at night grab the car keys, put on my jacket, drive down to the store and pick them up. I'm too lazy for that. So my fate is already sealed in advance. Now, I I know what a lot of you guys are going to respond because I have this exact conversation with my clients every day. Well, the junk food is in the house. You know, it's not for me. It's for the kids. It's for you know what your weaknesses are and they want you to be healthy and reach your health and wellness goals. They'll make the sacrifice. The things that are your weakness, if you're trying to go sugar free or limit sugar, Don't keep them in the house. Don't keep them accessible. Because then what you have to do is you have to put yourself through pain and make a conscious decision. Every time you walk by the pantry, I know you go, I can have willpower and say no. But you have to deprive your body of something it naturally enjoys every time. And that can create a sense of resentment for your efforts over time. And that's why people are like, well, I don't want to put it in this work. I deserve, I'm going to treat myself to because I have had a hard day. I have worked hard. If it's not in the house in the first place, that psychological process just never gets off the ground. You open the fridge, you find 10 other items that are healthy that you also like, and you're satisfied for the time. So my suggestion is from a practical nature, take the steps in advance, make the decision well in advance of you being tired, exhausted, and stressed, and have good options in the house versus the sugar. There's going to be plenty of opportunities to indulge once in a while, even if you don't keep it in your house regularly. It's funny. I can tell Gina from uh, experience working with uh, Jesse, my Met Pro coach, Jesse worked with me on those substitutes right away that, that at night, if I got that craving, she taught me that going for a a rice cake with a little bit of almond peanut butter on it tastes flipping delicious and not nearly the damage those Oreos are going to give me. (laughs) Ding, ding, ding. That's it. (laughs) You got it. (laughs) Yeah. Cause, and, and it's funny how, you know, over time, Angelo, that craving has changed. I mean, now instead of craving the Oreo at nine 30 at night, I crave the rice cake with a little bit of peanut butter on it. Your body is conditioned to it. And and also that is especially the case when it comes to limiting sugar. So when you have sugar, it creates a hormonal response in your body that it's been proven you're going to now crave sugar, especially in the next 24 to 48 hours. But if you can break that cycle, if you can go two to three days with minimal sugar, you will find that the cravings will subside. Now, it doesn't change the fact that chocolate tastes good, right? That's always (laughs) going to be the case. But those hormonal cravings for sugar will subside, the ones that are associated to the the ebb and flow of blood sugar. I said that was my last question, and I'm a liar because... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'll just put it, I'll put it very bluntly because Lisa actually has a related question. And she said that Joe recently mentioned the old sugar high I've gotten from eating a donut, right? Followed by the headache. And, and she said she gets the same thing, the headache. She said, where does the sugar headache come from? It's the spike and the drop. Uh, some people are susceptible to it. Others aren't. So some people can go high blood sugar and then low hypoglycemic in response to that. That's the body actually dumping a bunch of insulin into your system to compensate and it kind of overcompensates and now you end up going on the low side. And that's where some people experience that headache. Other times it can come from another layer related to that whole peak ebb and valley process. But some of the things that are general recommendations is to pair foods together. So if you are going to have something sugary, have it in the framework of a complete meal where there's some protein, maybe some healthy fats, some fiber, and that'll slow the digestion of, of those sugars. And then obviously to limit the quantities if, you, if you're going to have, you know, have it in small amounts. Yeah. If only... If only there was somebody that had written a book about this stuff might have coaches available. It'd be even better if there was like an app that I could get that might help me with this, some coaching that way. If only that existed, Angelo. Yeah, I've never heard of anything like that. (laughs) Well, for the people that are new here, tell them why I love MetPro so much. 
uh, because you love me, Joe. That's that is why. why. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we have the best job in the world. So we get to really dive in with those people who are like, look, I want to just have best practices across the board. Tell me what to eat. Tell me when to change what I'm eating. Tell me when to expect a plateau. And when I hit that plateau, give me the bite for bite strategy to bust through it. And at MetPro, we get to work with people day in and day out doing that, just like you. And it's a blast and we love it. It is. It is so fun. I love talking to Jesse. I love the uh, app. I love the workout suggestions that I got. We talk a lot about workout suggestions and Jesse helps me put those together. And I know for other people, the app now helps them put those together and put together uh, their meal plan. I love the tracking and seeing how I'm doing the accountability you know, um, as a former financial planner, just the fact that I'm accountable and I don't want to tell Jesse that I put that donut in my mouth. So, so <laughs> it's just like anything, even in the financial, you know, planning the enemy of results, the opposite of results is basically vague is lack of specificity, uh, is ambiguity yeah. in your strategy. And so if you are someone who is seeking specificity, do exactly this, take exactly those steps, then you can really build a strategy that you can evaluate and say, here's how my portfolio is responding, either good or bad, and make educated choices based on that. And uh, one more thing, as I gush about your company, Angelo, is that with the focus on my metabolism, I have to say that I generally go through very creative periods. Sometimes other times I don't feel very creative. Obviously we make a show where we need to be creative. I feel like my creativity level has been high. It's, it's, I won't say higher. I'll say more consistent, right? I'm more consistently feeling this creativity that I have when I feel on, I feel on and focused more often, which I think maintaining that metabolism versus just focusing on the bottom line scale, I think for me has been a fantastic thing for my ability to make this show. Ah, it's none of that. It just met pro makes you smarter. No, I love that Joe. I love that. So if you're interested in a free metabolic assessment, you get to meet with a coach, head to metpro.co slash SB. And also, Angela, people go there. If, if, if they're interested in the app, how do they do that? It's all the same. I'll go through the same channel and we're still going to talk to you and actually get to know you. We'll want to ask some questions. Hey, tell us about your circumstance. What is your day-to-day -day like? What is your lifestyle like? Because that all needs to be factored in and we want to get to know you. We love talking to people. That's awesome. Well, thanks for the time again today, my friend. And let's uh, let's do this again in about a month because I've got just a bunch more questions for you. And, and I'm also upset because I didn't make you sweat and we have to. <laughs> no, I'm good. Stay sweating. <laughs> Hey, trivia fans, it's the Mark Wahlberg of this here podcast, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I mentioned earlier how that guy's pivoted and reinvented himself so many times. Did you know he grew up in a bad area in Boston and dropped out of high school when he was just 14? Yep, right there, similarity number one. So how did he manage to graduate when he was 42 years old, though? He became the singer, rapper, and Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. Similarity number two, he's been an actor, a model. There's number three, he's the owner of the restaurant Wahlburger, and he even started the Mark Wahlberg Youth Foundation in 2001. Does this remind you of anyone else you know? Well, I'm not going to waste your time being bashful because we all know that this is almost a stroke-for-stroke stroke remake of yours truly. More about that later, but first, let's get to today's trivia. How much did Mark earn back in 2017 when he was the highest paid actor in Hollywood? I'll be back faster than you fighters can even transform and feel the vibration. You see what he did there? Paula has no idea what he did there. I was about to ask what movie he's been in, but I infer from that that he was in Transformers. He was a nice job. Well, yes. thank you. And Feel the Vibration is uh, Scott Trench's favorite song. That's right. Yes, absolutely. So... Here's the way this works. We play, we've been playing a game all year long and we have pitted 
our three regulars against each other and the score and Scott today you're playing on behalf of Len Penzo. The score is Len has eight. He's leading the way. Oh, gee, right on his heels with seven. And the woman who is slowly clawing her way back into this year game, Paula has five. So that means, Paula, you get to decide first. Would you like to guess first in the middle or last? I would like to guess last, please. Who knew? That's weird. Uh, oh, gee. Number two. Which means, Scott, you get to anchor this discussion. Huh? Huh? All right. How much money in 2017 did uh, Mark Wahlberg haul in? So it's the total amount of money he hauled in from all sources or from acting income. That's a fantastic question, Scott. And it is on movies, just as an actor. Just as an actor. And by the way, number two behind him was Dwayne Johnson. Number three was Vin Diesel. Number four was Adam Sandler. Number five was Jackie Chan. All right. That's a that's a beefy list. I seem to remember having looked up something to this effect a few years ago about just how much bankable Hollywood stars earn in a given year. And I want to say the numbers were in the ballpark of like the 50 plus million dollar range. So that's my anchor that I'm setting. See what I did there Uh, for for my uh, thought process here. Mark Wahlberg's pretty bankable guy. Been in some big movies, Transformers. I didn't watch any of them, but I'm I'm sure that was a, a high grossing one. I'm going to go a little higher than that and throw out a $73 million mark just from acting income. $73 million from acting. OG? Kind of smack dab in the middle where I was thinking too. Son of a gun. Um, who'd you say number two and number three were? Dwayne Johnson is number two, Vin Diesel Dwayne number Rock. three. Rock. And I heard those two guys like each other a lot. I would. I don't know. No, it's a it's a joke. They're known for fighting on set where they were making the uh, uh, Fast and Furious movies. Huh. Interesting. I follow The Rock on Instagram, so I could ask him. Yeah. Um, you know who I learned that trivia from? The OG was from Paula. She was <laughs> texting me, telling me. <laughs> She's about, like, "All right, so guys, check this out. I'm on Fast and Furious number right. seven. This is amazing." <laughs> Yeah. Paula's My hoping this Tokyo Drift. Right. With Paula's love of movies and the number of movies she sees, she's hoping this discussion is fast and furious. And we just get it yeah. get it behind yeah. her. I feel like this number's got to be a little higher than 70 million. The number I had in my head was somewhere between 70 and 140. So it would help if I knew what movies he was in in 2017. But uh I'm gonna say the number's a little higher. I'm gonna go with uh 101 million. 101. 101. Well, Paula, that gives you a big wide moat. Yeah. I mean, well, basically that means do I, do I think it's higher? Do I think it's somewhere in the middle? Do I think it's lower? Scott, what was your guess? You said 73 million? That's right. Yeah. I mean, if I said 72, I could claim anything that's underneath it. And that's a lot of numbers. But not as many numbers if you claim 102. <laughs> way more numbers above 102. Just so you know. If that's your barometer for success, how many numbers are that... above a certain number? <laughs> uh, but that, that just seems money. a little high it's to make a to make in the hundreds of millions just from movies. I mean, maybe overall, like from, through his business ventures, but. Just from movies? I feel like it's a double-digit number. I might have to guess 74. Yikes. You said might. Are you locking that in? Let's see. That gives me... Yeah. Hmm. Am I locking that in? Nah, you know what? I'm going to go with 72. Claim all the numbers beneath it. Oof. All so, these attacks on my number. So you, <laughs> you are, you are, you, you are locking that one in then. Yes, 72. I'm locking in 72. All right. 72, 73, and 101. We'd love to tell you who's right, but of course we have to uh, make you wait. What if you two could be balding and own your own podcast production company? Oh. Think that would be too good to be true? Well, strap on the wow helmet, kids, because we're about to introduce you to Stacking Benjamins in the Cab. Now, you too can create a moderately successful internet radio show from the comfort and privacy of your own mom's basement. That's right. Stacking Stacking Benjamins Benjamins in the Cab is the do-it-yourself kit that's creating tons of internet fun. 
What's included? Well, feast your eyes on this, kids. Open up your Stacking Stacking Benjamins Benjamins in the can, can, and you'll see 14 ways to talk about your latest trip to Bavaria. 18 of the worst bad dad jokes you've ever heard. Your own barely relevant holiday calendar. A sealed container brimming with the smells of stale basement air and day-old pizza. Plus, one script chock full of segue ideas. And because there was still a little room, we also shoved in your very own Steak Brother story. All in In the the can. can. But that's not all. Think we can't do better? Oh, yes, we can. We've also thrown in In the the can can five gratuitous references to OG's after-school activity, three boring tales about how cold it is in Detroit, and if you call in now, tons of free Sizzler coupons. How do you get it? You know that's not the question to ask. Oh, go ahead, ask us. How do I get it in In the the can? can? Here's the secret to stacking Benjamins in the can. Just head to your mom's basement, buy a microphone, and we'll take care of the rest. Stacking Stacking Benjamins Benjamins in in the the can can couldn't be easier. Still not sold? What if I told you Stacking Benjamins in the can is is gluten-free? That's right. Healthy, barely funny, and all stuffed into this refillable souvenir container. Call for yours today. Operators are standing by. No animals were harmed in the making of this recording. Scott, you kicked us off with $73 million. By the way, that number sounds suspiciously like the same number that uh, the CEO of Bigger Pockets would make. That's right. That's exactly right. That's, that's where I got that from. <laughs> you would, you would Mark, Mark Wahlberg make it the same, that, same. That's how I spend 50% of my income. That would that be great? Yeah, I, I just, yeah. You know, spend thirty cool thirty six and a half million. That's like year. when that's like when people always throw shade at those people that call in to Dave Ramsey. Well, you made one hundred and fifty. Of course, you could save. You know, I've got a really nice bike, Joe. Right, that's right. It'd be easy to pay off your twenty thousand dollars in credit card debt with seventy three million. Oh, gee, you're up there now. It looks a lot, lot higher at one hundred and one. Guess we're gonna find out. Let's well, see. guess we are. And Paula, everything south of seventy two. Yeah. I mean, given that I have no idea what the number is, but I suspect it's probably double digit, I'm feeling good. I think it'd be really funny if Paula won and this was a movie trivia thing. It would truly show just how shot in the dark our trivia is. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Doug, you got it from here, man. What's our answer? Hey, stackers, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Dougie Doug. And in honor of my doppelganger, Marky Mark, I've decided it's probably appropriate if I finish out the rest of this podcast shirtless. He's got pretty great abs, and I can do this with my chest. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, I know you can't see me, but feel free to imagine exactly how good I look right now. The amazing stares I've been getting from everyone here in the basement is all the proof I need that this needs to happen more often. Uh. I have so much more in common with Mark, too. I mean, he dropped out of high school while I finished the eighth grade at 17. Pretty close. Mark owns a restaurant, and I've been told that I order desserts at the Sizzler like I own the joint. Mark was the highest paid actor in Hollywood back in 2017, and I'm the highest paid voice actor on this here podcast. We're basically twins, right? I mean, you can hardly tell us apart, which reminds me back to today's trivia when Mark was the highest paid actor. How much did he make? Mark Wahlberg made an astounding $68 million in 2017, the year he starred in films such as The Transformers, Daddy's Home 2, and All the Money in the World. Well, it sounds like I need to score an agent so old Doug can get to work on catching Marky Mark on that front. See ya! Whoa! Awesome. <laughs> oh, I feel like I should get a point for being such a good anchor, guys. You... <laughs> great, great anchoring, Scott. <laughs> when she said 74 at first, I went, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That's a shocking amount of money. You were two very close, Paula, though, Scott. You were very close. And it was two in a row, Paula. Yeah. Wow. It shows you just how good guesswork can be. <laughs> I think it shows how good Scott Trench can be, and then you just Chelsea Brennan him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so it's cutthroat strategy. 
Paula now pulls up. She's only one behind OG. It gets more interesting as if it could be more interesting. It gets more interesting. Hey, let's uh, not let Paula gloat too long. Let's take out the magnifying glass and help somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to us courtesy of magnifymoney.com. When you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, Mr. Trench, you know what happens? What's that? You find out that those financial products you use every day, nowhere near best in class, especially if they're at a brick and mortar bank. Over 92% of the products available online, all ranked at Magnify Money. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money for more. And today, instead of having somebody call, we thought we would go to our friends at Reddit. And uh, this is an interesting Reddit conundrum that we wanted to get all three of your opinions on. And especially because all three of you also are real estate owners. So I'll read the question. Here it is, guys. We're selling our house in California and we're still living in the home. We're in contract and the buyers are having several inspections done. Home inspection, termite inspection, mold inspection, roof inspection, fireplace inspection. So far, they've had the roof, home, and mold inspection. The problem is the home inspector did some damage to our house when he was here. I'm pretty baffled because I've been present for home inspections for houses we bought. Never seen the inspector damage the house, including the inspection we did on this house when we bought it. He poked over 20 holes in the outside of our house, checking for dry rot. He broke off pieces of the siding in two spots where the wood was still good and not rot at all and poked holes so large and deep into the window frame that my husband's concerned about water getting into the house. He broke off the gold trim on one side of the fireplace doors, damaged the metal frame of our front glass door, and put a dent into one of our bed frames. I'm pretty annoyed. Our realtor brought up the fireplace with their realtor because this was the first thing we noticed, and their realtor said the inspector found it like that, which is just not true. We still live here. We know the fireplace was not like that when we left the house for him to do his inspection. What should we do? Do we wait and see if the sale goes through and let the buyers deal with the damage? And what happens if they back out of the sale? Are we responsible for repairing everything? And I'm so nervous to leave our house for the termite and fireplace inspection now. Is it weird if I stay home to make sure no more of our home is damaged? Uh, we never start OG with you. Let's start with you on this one. What are you thinking? I don't know. I would call an attorney and hand it off to somebody else. We're talking about uh, anchoring before on the article. And one of the comments in there was about your hourly rate. This is not for me to deal with or trifle with. The guy or gal did the damage. I mean, it's going to be tough to prove, but, you know, and if, he, if you called him up on the phone and said, hey, I think you did all this damage, you got to come fix it, immediately he's likely to get super defensive, and what, where does that get you? Nowhere. So, I don't know. This is a tough one, and uh, uh, I wouldn't want to be anywhere near it, so I would uh, have the attorney handle it. Scott, you agree? You know, I, I think it depends on the amount of the damages in terms of, of their impact on your lifestyle right now and the dollar amount. You know, right now, this person has not lost anything quite yet, right? Because there's some damage done, but if the buyer goes through with the purchase, then that becomes the buyer's problem, not theirs, right? So what I would do in this situation is I'd document everything I could. And because you probably don't have before and after photos that you have time stamped, it's there's going to be a bit of he said, she said here, where the inspector you know, to OG's point, the inspector's going to get defensive. They may deny the claims or whatever, and you may not have a strong enough case to present in court to necessarily deal with that. But then there's like, there's three possible outcomes once you understand the scope of the damages and have your, as much documentation as you can put together, right? One is the buyer makes no objection to this and asks for no concession through the inspection objection deadline. In that case, you can simply provide the documentation to the buyer, letting them know the damage that the inspector did and move on with the sale. That's the best case scenario. The second scenario that's possible is the buyer comes back and asks for concessions, which involve mitigating these types of damages. That's the one where you're going to get the most annoyed, yeah. <laughs> I think, because you're going to be like, "What? what's going on? With I I, I, well, this, this would, actually, that would be the, where I get the most annoyed. That would be one where I get a little annoyed. The third possibility is where I get the most annoyed. But basically, you know, that's the time to bring up the damages, show the documentation to the buyer agent and the buyer, and kind of make that case hey, as professionally and calmly as you can without the inspector present. 
And from there, you can work it out and use that as a negotiating chip, but you don't want to lose the sale for a few hundred or even a thousand or two dollars in, in concessions. This happens all the time in, in a closing process. If you're in selling, if you're in Southern California, this is not going to be a major percentage of the over, overall transaction. And the third possibility is the buyer backs out completely from the deal because of these damages. In that case, you're going to have to exercise a judgment call and either withhold, try to fight to withhold the earnest money, let it go, or figure something else out. And the last thing I want to point out here is your realtor should be helping you out with this problem if they know what they're doing and they're a real professional. You shouldn't have to come on Reddit and ask these questions for us. Right. You really should have got a new realtor right. in the first place. So if the buyer backs out, I'd fire your realtor and move on. Uh, Paula? Very well said. So plus one to all of that. I also read the comments on this Reddit thread. One of the people in the comments asked whether or not this home is being sold as is. And the person who posted the original thread responded and said, yes, the home is being sold as is. So that actually simplifies the situation a little bit because we know that the buyer is not going to be asking for repairs or asking for concessions. Well, I mean, they could ask for concessions, but, uh, or, you know, they could ask for additional, they could try to aggressively renegotiate during the due diligence period. But it indicates to me with the home being sold as is that the buyer is sending in so many inspectors in order to get a really solid sense of the condition of the home. And so it seems to me as though the, the likely outcomes might be either that the, the transaction goes through or it doesn't. But in any event, I agree with Scott. I would document everything, take lots of pictures, and I would send an email to the inspector, not because of the response that you hope to get from them, but so that you have documentation that you went to the inspector and immediately reported the damages um, so that, you know, it's just another piece of documentation that uh, that backs up your argument if and when later you try to to claim that this is new damage that was not present in the home prior to the arrival of the inspector. And to the guy's question, um, you know, we've got some more inspectors coming. Can I stay at home while they're here? Yeah, it's your house. You know, you can stay there. And particularly now it's social distancing, COVID-19. Of course you can stay in your own house. It's so weird, though, that an inspector would create that kind of damage. Have any of you guys had a problem with that before? No, it, it does bring up an additional possibility here, which is that you know, this person is exaggerating or, or unfamiliar with the practices of, of selling a home or, or particularly observant of those things. But I, I've never heard of that. And, and presuming that this person is being reasonable with what they're describing, it probably means that the inspector, you need to report that, maybe not to the inspector, but to the inspector's company or boss and let them know about that experience with them so that they can provide training or feedback. Not to think nefariously at all, but what's the chance that this person's exaggerating because these problems were already in the house? And now they're going to blame it on the inspector. I, I, I you, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at some point you see everything. But have have you guys had? I've never had an inspector problem. Paula, you had an inspector problem. OG, no, never had an inspector problem. And one thing that I thought right away when I read about this was if he's easily poking holes through through the walls, <laughs> there's dry rot. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, OG, would you think an inspector would do that without any thinking that there's got to be something wrong? I'm not well versed in inspectorisms, but I can tell you having bought a couple of apartment buildings, they are worth their weight in gold because I backed out of probably three deals because of the inspector that I have. And it was very expensive. I remember thinking like, man, I'm so tired of writing this dude checks. But I was happy that I did every time because he would come back and say, now you don't want this one, and here's the list of 10 things why, you know, and it helped quite a bit. I can tell you that the most recent purchase that we had had a roof issue and was allegedly repaired, and so we had a roof inspector also sign off on the repair, even though it was pretty evident that it wasn't done correctly. I mean, you could just tell from looking at it, it wasn't done right. So we contacted the company who did it, and they just basically said, yeah, we're not going to do anything about this. It's been, you know, two months since we were up there, so tough patooties. And then the uh, roofing inspector said, well, you know, probably could have been done better, but it's fine. Uh, lo and behold, it rained a whole bunch up there a couple of weeks ago, and um, turns out it wasn't fine. And uh, and we have had the real estate attorney send a letter to the construction company or the real estate or the uh, roofing company, rather. And the roofing company has basically said, come and get us. Good luck. 
well, you know, we're not doing anything about it. We recognize we never finished it, and um, that's you too bad, so sad. And this is the importance of leaving online reviews for professionals that you work with in this space because there's so much out there that is not documented, and all we have really at the end of the day is reputation online yeah. and, and referrals. Well, unfortunately, this company was from out of state and already has a whatever the lowest you can get D minus I'm better business bureau <laughs> and was hired was hired by the former owners because oh. the all the other quotes provided were in the fifty sixty thousand dollar range to repair the roof and these guys were gonna do it for fifteen. Wow amazing. So uh um, are, are you so saying got, cheaper wasn't better? So they got their fifteen thousand dollars worth of work, allegedly. But um uh anyway so yeah, so we we're, a, we're definitely left picking up the pieces, but but we knew that going into it. So this was, you know, back to the inspector piece. He told us, he's like, listen, it's not done. It's going to cause you a problem at some point in time. Maybe, maybe not a year from now, maybe five years from now, maybe tomorrow. I'm not sure, but it's not done right. And you're going to have to deal with this. So that factored into our decision making. Still sucks, but. We have a saying on Bigger Pockets that uh, if you think a hundred dollar an hour electrician is expensive, try hiring a ten dollar an hour right. electrician. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I love that. Uh, hey, if you've got a question for our roundtable gang or for our regular shows on Monday or Wednesday, uh, drop us a line. It's stackofbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail, and we're happy to answer your question. We just took a break from those today because this was such an interesting question. We definitely wanted one real estate focused with the three of you together. Hey, that's going to do it for today. Once again, we will talk to our guest of honor last about what's happening at Bigger Pockets Money. But OG, what do you got going on this weekend, man? Uh, fun weekend for me, actually, golf tournament, believe it or not. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, I can't, uh, can't wait, actually. Trying to, trying to get back in the, wait for it, swing it. Uh -huh. Oh, <laughs> man, he's on fire. Oh. And, and we get him here three days a week. Paula, what's happening at the crazy Afford Anything podcast? Uh, on the Afford Anything podcast, we have an interview with Michael Hyatt. He is a business leader who wrote a book about how the importance of having vision. So, And that's one of those things that's not often talked about. People talk about strategy or tactic, but how do you systematically go through the steps to make sure that you have a vision that's big enough and aligned with reality enough? Better glasses. So, Oh, that was a bad joke. Sorry. Wait, I didn't. I didn't hear you. I heard something about glasses. I said better glasses. Ah, but I'm <laughs> so bad. Uh, better vision, better glasses. <laughs> I, I, I would say I've got uh, 2020 vision. Bam! It's fa fantastic. <laughs> Given that it's 2020, and I can see the year ahead. And you'll find, it's so funny when you describe to me who Michael Hyatt is. Maybe a lot of people listening don't know who Michael Hyatt is. When you, you said, so Michael Hyatt, he's a, I'm like, it's flipping Michael Hyatt. That's what it is. <laughs> Michael Hyatt. Yes. Scott, thanks a ton for hanging out with us, man. This has been great. Yeah, thanks for having me. And what's weird is, talking about bad jokes, I think we infringed on your territory because you have a reputation for two things on Bigger Pockets Money. A, some fun but deep conversations but also for some truly atrocious jokes. Yeah, I don't really have any any chip shots like OG today, unfortunately. <laughs> so we'll have to come back. Nice. Good work. Yeah. Ninja. That was Ninja. But tell everybody what you guys do at I'm Bigger Pockets with Money. These golf jokes. Ah. Uh, yeah, well, so uh, I guess the next episode for us for Bigger Pockets Money is going to be with um, I Will Teach You to Be Rich author Ramit Sethi. Who? So we're going to talk about. Ramit Sethi. We're I've... going to talk to him about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, all right, all right. We're gonna we're gonna be chatting with him about uh, how he's how he thinks about the uh, responding financially to the new coronavirus economy and and, and uh, situation that we're all in. That's incredible. And for people who haven't heard the show, by the way, as you know, I'm a big fan of the show. But tell everybody what you do there. Sure. So Bigger Pockets uh, has a reputation around real estate investing specifically. Mindy and I, um, you know, and, and real estate as a tool to move toward financial independence. Mindy and I host the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, which is all about getting your financial house in order, getting the financial foundation in place to make life changing investments, such as those in real estate, small businesses, stock investing, those types of things. So we talk about that every week, all day long, every day. Yeah, it's it's so fun, and it's where better podcasts are distributed. That's going to do it for today, everybody. Uh, thanks a ton for playing. Doug's got a lot of thank yous. But Doug, first of all, what should we have learned today, man? 
Yeah, Joe, once again, sounds like you can't pay attention, so I'll tell everybody what they should have learned. First, take a lesson from our roundtable. Looking to pivot? Make a change quickly, and you're much more likely to be satisfied with your results. Second, take a lesson from Angelo Poli of MetPro. Diet and exercise is the answer to getting rid of your COVID-19. Huh, haven't heard of that combo before. I'll give it a try. But the big takeaway... No matter how great your Wahlberg dance moves are, don't try to dance off against Joe's mom. That lady can break dance way better than you. Way better. Big thanks, see how I did that, to Scott Trench from Bigger Pockets Money for joining our roundtable today to discuss anchoring our money instead of just floating around. You can find Scott and Mindy's podcast, Bigger Pockets Money, wherever you are listening to this finer podcast or on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Also, thanks to Angelo Poli for helping us lose that COVID-19. You'll find resources from our affiliate page at metpro.co slash SB. Paula Pant appears courtesy of affordanything.com and the Afford Anything podcast. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahigh, produced by Karen Rapine, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I really thought doing these credits completely naked would have been a lot more fun than it actually was. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Also, hey, Marky Mark, I know you're listening. Check out my new dance, the Dougie. Never been done before. I think it's going to catch on. Oh, oh, oh. Wait, his birthday was when? Last week? And he didn't even call me? Hey, come on, Marky, I thought we were buds. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What exist? Wow. Can't say that word. What happens in the after show stays in the after show, Scott. So you can't talk about this, man. Got to, All right. Got to, got to leave it. But you, you know, it's interesting. We talk about anchors. A lot of the time people have anchors that are so strong that they are sure that they're right. And then they find out later that they're not right. Sometimes in very embarrassing ways. And I'll I'll give you an example. I was on this date one time, the waiter came up and I looked at the wine list and there were only two of us. So I said to the waiter, I said, cause I'd only read the word before I said, I'd like a carafe of wine. And the guy, cause it's spelled C A R A F E. And, uh, the dude looks at me and goes, absolutely. I'll bring back a carafe of that wine. And you could tell he's trying hard not to laugh at me in front of my, my date, but that anchor was strong, but that's not a money anchor. I was wondering if anybody has maybe a, maybe he a, was thinking that you are an idiot. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> uh, what a moron. <laughs> I've got a really good one. That's around food too, it, but it doesn't involve me. I got a, she's going to kill me, but she probably won't listen to it. So it's totally fine. We were having dinner at, um, I'm not exactly sure, you know, like a PF Chang's or something type, uh, Asian cuisine, <clears throat> and uh, my bride is trying to decide what to order, <clears throat> and she she decides to order the food with the uh, and she's you can tell that she's trying to figure out how to say it, and she's like, I'll have the um um sh- sh- 
Headache mushrooms? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, those sound delicious. <laughs> <laughs> she'll deny it if she ever hears me tell this or she'll say no that didn't happen it totally happened because i almost lost my i almost lost my carafe of wine <laughs> because i'm like i'm pretty sure even if that was what they were correctly pronounced they would not actually name them that <laughs> like, oh, what, what kind of what, what should we name these mushrooms oh sh- ache. yes <laughs> sh- ache mushrooms yeah, uh, I I can see them in the in, in the meeting. Hey, Earl, uh, your name's not sell. Nobody's buying this stuff. <laughs> Let's make it sound a little bit uh, fancy. Foo foo, <laughs> shiitake. Yes, we'll just change it around. Give it a different way to pronounce it. I don't have any good money stories, but that one was. But as soon as you said that, uh, that popped in my head. Right yeah, Scott or Paula. I can think of a ton of words I've mispronounced. It has nothing to do with money. No, it just, yeah, <laughs> wrong anchor there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like a thermometer. For most of my life, I've called that thermometer. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. Well, so I, I pick up these mispronunciations from my parents because my parents uh, speak English as a second language, really as a third language. And so they're just, there are these words that they don't know how to say. And then I pick that up from them and it sticks. So like thermometer cauliflower instead of cauliflower yeah all those kinds of stuff and sometimes i'll also pick up various phrases that they say that are common phrases but they're just a little bit off like my dad he never says throw it away he just says throw it you know so i'm like hey dad what do you want me to do with the stack of magazines and he's like throw it he's like what <laughs> so yeah i've slowly unlearned a bunch of those over time I but sometimes- every now and again i still bust out with one I sometimes thought growing up that my dad was speaking English as a third language, but but because he would like, instead of wash the dishes, it was always, there was an R in there. It's wash, Mm, wash. Is is, is, is that a Michigan thing, OG? Is that what that is? Wash the dishes? Uh, I'm not sure, but I can say that the other day we were watching some news from Michigan and um, both of my kids came down and they said, why do they sound all Canadian? (laughs) I know. I said, yeah. Yeah, you can kind of hear it now after we've been down here a long time. Okay, dear. Yeah, you kind of hear the a little bit of the uh, phraseology that's a little bit different, but a little twang. Scott, you've never messed any of this stuff up. No, I've I've ordered Mindstone before um, in the past. I've <laughs> <laughs> ordered a bunch of these. So the uh, you thinking about it, an anchor that I got way wrong. I'll give you a travel hacking. I thought that was a big scam, and you know, kind of scammy at least, or you know, was clearly not a way to to be profitable as an individual. Opening up new credit cards for points and those types of things, and then I I did some research on it and found, hey, you know, I'm going to do the exact same thing I've been doing spend responsibly and you know i'm not going to rack up lots of bills or, or fees i'm just going to get a lot of a lot more free travel but but but, Is that but, the- but that was pretty honestly like i could totally see you honestly coming by that one what do you mean i mean that thinking at first that this whole thing is just one big scam is uh yeah, I I did. I thought I was like, yeah, it's, it's it's opening up a credit cards. That seems like the last that this is the, the opposite of of sound finance at at first. So I just totally dismissed it. Mental block. Didn't pay attention to it for a long time to my loss. But but I've also seen and you've seen people like this too though that do travel hacking, but they get like half of it right. I was I was talking to a travel hacker. He thought he was a travel hacker recently, and and he was bragging that he had like 26 open credit cards. And I said to him, I'm like, so what's the annual fee on those? And he goes, oh man, I don't, I don't, I, I honestly don't ever look. And I'm like, you're just, you're paid. If, if, if you do the first half right and you open them and you never, <laughs> and you never really follow through, you're getting hammered in fees. He's like, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I have three travel hacking cards that I've opened in the last two years. Got the Southwest companion pass. It's been a delight. Saved me a lot of money. But I certainly don't take it that crazy. And I feel like if you do, you're at risk of being in that guy's trap and having a lot of different fees and things you can't. At that point, when the complexity gets really high, you will lose, I think. Yeah, then all you can afford is the minstrone soup. That's right. 